Good morning, Wildcats. Welcome to 307 News, where we discuss current events on the University of Arizona's campus. I'm Julia Mortarelli. And I'm Gabby Rosenberg. You know, Julia, this is our first ever 307 Newscast. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling very lucky, Gabby. Thanks for asking. Awesome. So this spring season would have been the 50th anniversary of the University of Arizona's student-led carnival. The spring fling has been absent since the pandemic. Will it be back? Reporter Erilyn Hyatt has more. The University of Arizona replaced their annual student-led carnival with the music festival. Spring Fling started in 1974 and has grown to be the largest student-run carnival. This event included over 25 attractions and at least 20 food booths, attracting crowds of 25,000 people. The last Spring Fling was in April 2019 and the year after it was canceled due to COVID. Spring Fling has yet to return to campus after five years. There is a whole graduating class that has never experienced Spring Fling or any type of student-led event organized by AS ASUA. On Monday, March 25th, ASUA and the Wildcats Events Board announced that the Spring Fling Carnival is officially gone and will be replaced with a music festival, according to asuatoday.arizona.edu. The music festival is called Bear Down Music Festival and took place at the U of A Mall. It featured six different artists, including Sophia Rankin and The Sound, The Hawthorne Experience, Desert Child, The Band, DJ Fausto, Durazo, Red Veil, and Coin. Festival goers were able to purchase wristbands for $7. The event included other attractions that were also included with the wristband. This new scaled down version of Spring Fling debuted on April 12th. Will students embrace it? Only time will tell. Thanks, Erilyn. This year's lineup was great. It was so exciting to see the community come together on campus. Pacific Roots is a club for students of the Pacific Islander's descent, trying to expand to more students on campus. Gabriela Fernandez speaks more on the subject. So I am the president and founder of UA Pacific Roots. I, as a freshman, I wanted to have the community here. And so I, I feel like I have the drive and I had the, not, not given the responsibility, but I felt like I had a certain responsibility in me to try and help these other students find something that I was missing here on campus. UA Pacific Roots is a um, Pacific Islander um, organization that was recently started um, last year in the spring, but has been officially considered an ASUA APASA group this fall, this past fall, 2024, 2023. Um, we are trying to bring the Pacific Islander community together as we haven't had one that really has stuck or has planted roots in the universe with the university. Growing up on Guam for the past 10 years, I really was in my culture. Like everybody around me was in the culture, whether they were a part of it or they were a part of a different culture. They were forced and welcomed into learning about the culture of Guam and being a Chamorro and being of Chamorro descent. And we really, I really thrive on that since I was born in the States and I moved. I appreciated that a lot and I wanted people at the university to also feel some sort of comfort with connecting with their cultures or related cultures or even just being around people who they show certain similarities with. For me, like coming into college was scary and it kind of helped me to like see other people who looked like me and came from like similar backgrounds as me and just having like that extra sense of community made made it feel a little bit a little bit more like home for me. I think it's a great way for many parts of Oceania to um, to meet each other, especially with the different regions of the Pacific. As a Micronesian and from Guam, it's different to look at the other perspectives of all these other regions and how they see their culture and how much their culture impacts them as well as like the smaller regions and how it all can be put together. As a culture, we really enjoy spending time with each other. That spending time with each other is just easy. And so with Pacific Island culture, we love to eat and we love to hang around, we love to listen to music. And so we just try to keep it in, some, in um, an area where everyone feels some, some sort of like at home or peace. Um, like I said, like the group really just makes me feel at home and college is such like a big transition in your life, especially if you're like moving away from home. I think having these spaces 
can help. And I also think it's important to give representation to minority groups to make sure that they have voices on campus. Describe the club in three words. Family, inclusivity, and good food. Both Wildcats men's and women's basketball teams ended their seasons early in the NCAA tournaments. Several transfers make the future uncertain. Let's go to sports for more. Good morning, Arizona sports fans. I'm Reed Lofsted. And I'm Gregor McKelligan, and you're watching 307 News. With big wins against Long Beach State and Dayton, the Arizona B Wildcats basketball team looked like they were catching fire as they went into the Sweet 16. However, this is not the case. The Wildcats were bounced from the tournament after an upsetting loss to Clemson. The Wildcats have six losses in their last six tournament appearances against teams seeded four spots lower. The longest such streaks in seeding began. The Cats shot a season low 18% from the three-point line. Caleb Love, one of the lead stars for Arizona and a dependable three-point shooter, went 0 for 9 on the night. Love had not found his shot since the start of the tournament, where he shot 3 for 12 against Long Beach State. Umar Ball also had a poor shooting night, shooting 1 for 7 from the, th from the free throw line. The Tigers scored a circus layup and a foul in the final seconds, which put the game out of reach and sent the Wildcats packing. In, uh, so many three-point attempts? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Clemson did a good job and, you know, kind of got us on our heels offensive, offensively early in the game. And, uh, and and we settled for a lot of tough shots. And then that's what kind of allowed them to get out because I think, I think our defense was actually okay early and it was kind of low scoring early and we're right there. And then, you know, they got it going offensively a little bit and we just never quite did until later in the, in the first half. And, yeah, the second half we made a con more concerted effort. We wanted to attack those guys, move the ball, attack, drive closeouts, you know, pl play with our feet in the ground in the paint. And our guys did a much better job uh, of that in the second half. The Wildcats' star of the game was bench player Jaden Bradley. Bradley would score 18. This was his second highest scoring outing of the season behind a 21-point game against ASU. Bradley, a sophomore, is supposed to build off his successful first season under Tommy Lloyd. Next year. Uh, you know, I say shout out to the coaches and the players for you know taking me in and helping me develop my game. You know, I was familiar with you know Coach Coach Lloyd and you know the culture, and just to have a fresh start kind of seemed like and. You know, they did a great job of helping me uh, achieve my goals, but, you know, still got it next year and, you know, just lo love these guys. Arizona starts their inaugural Big 12 basketball season next year and will do so without some of their biggest stars. Omar Balu, Callum Boswell, and Dylan Anderson have announced they'll be entering the transfer portal. While this comes as a shock to Wildcats fans, the future is still bright in Tucson. Arizona has the second best recruiting class in the nation and has some key returning players like Bradley and Matthias Krivas. The Wildcats women's basketball team battled a season-long struggle with injuries. Arizona started the season with 12 players, which was then whittled down to seven in February, prompting the team to host open tryouts. Despite their issues, they still made the tournament and defeated Auburn in a first four matchup, Arizona's fourth straight opening win in the tournament. The Wildcats advanced to the round at 64 as an 11th seed to face the six-seeded Syracuse Orange. The Orange entered the tournament with a 24-7 record, tied for second in the ACC. Arizona entered the game with just two players on the bench. Arizona led for a majority of the game, but Syracuse hit two late jumpers to seal the victory. A bright spot for Arizona was Skylar Jones, who scored 24 points with six boards and five assists. Despite an injury-prone season, the Cats will be looking to improve greatly when they enter the Big 12. And after weeks of wild tournament play, South Carolina defeated Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes for the Women's National Championship. UConn also won their second men's championship in two years after defeating AP Player of the Year Zach Eady and the Purdue Boilermakers. It'll sure be interesting to see Arizona's five-star recruit Carter Bryant play for the Wildcats next season. It's going to be a completely different look. That's all we have for you today. I'm Reed Lofsted. And I'm Gregor McKelligan. And bear, bear down, down, Arizona. Arizona. In recent events, University of Arizona's co-ed pickleball team went to nationals for the second year in a row. Our very own Jackson Hers had a chance to talk with the president, getting an inside scoop on the club sport. All right, my name is Brandon Tong. Uh, I am the captain and treasurer of the pickleball team. And going to nationals for me is super exciting just because we we're only one year old. Being able to qualify and compete in nationals with only being one year old is, I think, a great achievement for us. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Michael McDonald. I am a sophomore here at the University of Arizona. And so we decided to build, um, we started at four, and then now we've worked our way up to six. Um, and then we've got a lot of interest. A lot of people have been showing up, supporting us. And then now we got the competitive team. You know, it's, so it's been awesome to see it grow. And nationals means a lot to see this program not even, you know, been around two years ago, and now we're already going to nationals. And I feel confident the team we're sending and will be really competitive. So it'll be a fun, fun event. So I'm Sam Krausor. I'm a senior here at University of Arizona. For me, pickleball has been, you know, it started out as just a fun game and to see it kind of come into this competitive nature in college has just been awesome. Here at the University of Arizona Pickleball Club, um, we'll set up the nets is the first step we'll do. And then uh, we'll provide paddles and balls to people in the club. And then people will start just practicing, you know, volleying back and forth with each other and uh, getting to go and then ready to start the game. So pickleball scoring is very simple. You have two players on each team or one player, depending on how you're playing. And you serve, you get the point, you swap sides. If you don't, serve, or if you don't score, then the second uh, person on your team serves, gets a point. If they don't, then the ball goes to the other team and roles are reversed. Wow, he really served that interview, but can he serve the weather? Back to Jackson Hurst with this year's weather phenomenon. Arizona has experienced above average rainfall this year with almost an inch more rain than usual in January. It was the 16th wettest January on record dating back to 1894. In February, Arizona had half an inch more rainfall than average. February saw high winds all month with February having peak wind gusts over the past 50 years. On February 6th, wind gusts topped 59 miles per hour. In March, the rain continued with Arizona having 1.25 inches of rainfall, which is almost an inch more than average. All this rain means that Southern Arizona will likely have a more intense fire season because of the greater grass and brush growth. Northern Arizona should have a delayed fire season due to the amount of snow they gotten. Last year, 71% of all wildfires were human caused. More than 188,000 acres burned last year. Governor Katie Hobbs laid out precautionary measures people should take to help mitigate the fire danger. Hobbs also said she is giving firefighters the resources they need to combat fires. She proposed $27 million to protect communities. In helping with food insecurities, the campus pantry has found a way to help students struggling with accessibility to food. Brianna Ortiz tells us more about the pantry project. Yeah, so campus pantry was initially an idea that one of the students at the U of A had. Um, so it was like an idea that started in 2012. Um, and then it was like originally founded in like 2013. Um, so basically it's a program that provides um, supplemental groceries to students, faculty and staff at the University of Arizona. Obviously back then they identified a need in like um, food and like the issue of food insecurity on college campuses. Obviously they wanted to do something about that. So that's how they started up the campus pantry program. And now we are here today in our lovely space and we just basically give back to our UA community as best as we can. So uh, we are we operate three days uh, out of the week, so Tuesdays from 2 to 6 p.m. and then Wednesdays and Fridays from 11 to 3 p.m. Uh, students, faculty, and staff are allowed to come two times per week, so they can choose whichever one of those days they would like to come, whatever fits with their schedule. Uh, and basically all they need is their cat card, so they just come in, they swipe their cat card. We provide them a basket and they're basically free to shop around our space. It's a client uh, Based uh, model, so it's like a mini grocery store. However, we are just like a short-term solution, so it's just a, it operates the same way. It's free, and then at the end of their shopping experience, we just weigh their basket, and then we get the final weight. And yeah, and then they just transfer their food items into their bags. The food insecurity is very um, prevalent on college campuses, especially since students are in like different situations. Um, there's some students that are coming from like home transferring here like long distances from home so they don't have that like dependence on their family so a lot of them they're full-time students some of them are working part-time um, however that's not the reality for all students so they don't have that um, reliable income to like be you know uh, spending money on like basic needs like food and stuff like that and they have other responsibilities and priorities that they have to uh, pay mind to as well um, 
and with like food insecurity it affects like their academics their mental health physical well-being so we try our best with our services to kind of reduce or like at least alleviate some of those symptoms associated with food insecurity so we receive donations from like our ua community and local organizations as well uh, we have partnerships with like the ua rooftop greenhouse and they provide certain produce items weekly and then we also have partnerships with the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona and um, the Midwest Food Bank, and they provide food items as well. So Community Food Bank provides um, like a large um, palette of produce, and they also provide bread items as well. And then the Midwest Food Bank provides like other um, donated goods. Usually it's like once every semester, but it's a pretty large donation. And yeah, for the most part, a lot of students, faculty, and staff donate. Um, we have like different donation um, areas that people can donate to. And we also, so we have like those in-kind donations. And then we have like our monetary donations that we receive through the UA Cares Foundation. And we kind of use that money to spend on like groceries and stuff. Thank you for watching the very first broadcast of 307 News. I am Gabby Rosenberg. And I'm Julie Mortarelli. See you soon, Wildcats, and bear down.